Fifth hour with Mr. Van Glar. Welcome to second hour. Yeah, Lydia. What? Si, señorita. Muy bien, español. Yes, fifth hour, second hour, so good. We learn math and Spanish. Uh, hopefully, we get to learning math in fifth hour someday. Boom, roasted. All right. Now, remember, these are the notes where we are looking over chapter five and chapter six. Uh, we are going to start out with looking at and remembering the idea of domain and range. Now, if you remember way back to chapter five, domain is talking about what our possible x values are, and range is talking about what our possible y values are. And we had two different types of situations where we would, where we would give domain and range. One was when we had a discrete domain and the other was, does anyone remember what the second one was? Continuous. Very, who said that? Very good. I don't know why that's, there we go. Now, remember, a discrete domain means that we can list all the possible x values, that we have x values that are listable. I don't know if that's an actual word, but it is what it is. We could say, hey, all of our domains, all the numbers in our domain are one, two, three, four, and five. We could list all of them. On a graph, that might look something like this, where we have those dots on our graph that we could list every number in our domain. Continuous means that there is an infinite number of x values, meaning if we had our graph that looked like this, we would not be able to list every x value that's in the domain. Even if we had something that looked like this, we would not be able to list them all. This goes back to the idea that a line or even a line segment is made up of an infinite number of points. Like there's an infinite number of little points that make this up. There are an infinite number of little points that make up that line. So if we have any type of line that would be continuous, if we have those dots on our graph, it could be discrete. Remember with this, context makes a difference too. They'd give you a story problem and they would give you like something where the x values are like cats and then the y value is money. And I guess you could have half a cat, but you probably shouldn't. So we would say that the domain of cats or we had like belts or we had uh, different things like that if cats or belts or something like that is our domain, it does not make sense to have half of them or a third of them or anything like that. Uh, so that would be a discrete domain. A continuous domain would be something like time. We could split time in as many sections as we wanted to. Another thing we saw in chapter five, I've got to find a really good color. How about green? Is function notation. Now, function notation just meant that instead of having y equals, we wrote f of x instead. Remember, those two things mean the exact same thing. f of x just is a fancier way of saying y equals. So if we had f of x equals 2x minus 3, that would be the same thing as saying y equals 2x minus 3. We still have a y-intercept at negative 3, a slope of 2, all that kind of stuff. There are two things that they had you do with function notation. They would have you solve when x equals 2. And that would mean we just plug 2 in for x and we solve. They also would say something like solve when, and this is where we have to be careful, f of x equals, let's say, 13. 
Now, if they say solve when f of x equals 13, that means we're taking 13 and replacing f of x. So I hope you see the difference between those two situations, that for one of them, we are looking for x. For the other one, we are finding f of x. Really over here, we have f of 3 equals that. f of, oh, excuse me, f of 2, because we plug 2 in. f of 2 equals. So those are the two things we'd have to do with function notation. We have to know what it's talking about. Remember, a function means we have one input and one output. So we have to know what it's talking about. We also have to be able to find x, and then we have to be able to solve for f of x. So plug something in for x, plug something in for f of x. Another item. If I'm going too quick, then slow me down. Like I said, I'll post these notes on Canvas, but if you have further questions about something, you're more than welcome to slow me down. I am trying to go a little bit quicker, so fifth hour doesn't have to watch too long of a video. But linear or nonlinear. Remember, linear just means that we're working with a line. They could give us a graph and they could say, is this linear or not? Well, if we have a line, then it's linear. They also could give us a table. And let's say we had like 5, 10, 15. Well, the x's and the y's are going up by the same amount, so that would be linear. If we have a line, that's linear. Something that would be nonlinear that they could give us would be like a parabola, which we've seen before. That is not linear. That's not form a straight line. Or they could give us a circle. They've done that before. Or they could make something up. I mean, they could draw anything they wanted to on this graph and ask us if it forms a line. If we had a table, 0, 1, 2. They could give us something like 5, 20, and 70. Those are not all going up by the same amount. We're going up by 15, then we're going up by 50. So that would be nonlinear. That idea of the vertical line test kind of came up with this as well. Remember when I stood up on the board and I had my, oh, maybe it broke. They don't have it anymore. And I had that ruler. Oh, maybe I used this one. I don't know. And I stood and we ran our ruler across the line. And we decided to see if it ever touched at two points. Like over here. We would look at, let's look at this one. We would say, we'd run our ruler across it and we would decide if it touches at more than one point, then we would not have a function or vertical line test. That goes a little bit with both of these sections here, the function notation and linear and nonlinear. We can have something that is, um, that is nonlinear that still passes this vertical line test. If we were to run a line across this, our pencil across it, it only would hit one point at a time but if we were to run our pencil or our ruler across this one, we have several points where it's hitting at the same time. So remember, this would be not a function. Again, trying to make the connection between these two boxes a little bit. Got one more thing from chapter 5 that we'll look at here. And it is arithmetic sequences.
remember, with an arithmetic sequence, that means that we are either adding or subtracting between terms. The form of an arithmetic sequence is a sub n equals a sub 1 plus n minus 1 times d. This would be considered an explicit equation because I could explicitly tell you without swearing to find the 150th term and you could plug 150 in and you could solve for whatever that is. They also will use language like find the write an equation for the nth term. That would be another way that they ask you to write an equation here. And the last thing they might do with this is say find a sub 25. So they might tell you to write a general equation for everything. So you have n still in there. But if they say find a sub 25, now you're plugging 25 in. You're solving for whatever that term would be. And I'm not going over examples because that, that's what you're going to practice on your review. Right? So I'm just reminding you of the formulas and all that kind of thing. Does anyone have anything to add to Chapter 5? Is there anything that you loved from Chapter 5 that I forgot to talk about? Andre, did I hit your favorite stuff from Chapter 5? Yeah? Nothing I missed? Okay. Let's take a look then at Chapter 6. This will go a little bit quicker. You guys are doing good. <clears throat> Chapter 6 started out with some rules. And first it was square root rules, or properties might be the better word. And we looked at two of them. One of them was when we have the square root of x times y, we're allowed to break that up into the square root of x times the square root of y. The second one was when we had a fraction, x over y, we could break that up into the square root of x over the square root of y. Now does anyone remember what we used really this first property for? What did we do with that first property? If I gave you the square root of 12, what would you then do with that? This might be a rough exam. Lydia, what do you got? Save us. Yeah. Into what? 12 and 1, 6 and 2, 3 and 4, 7 plus 5, 3 and 4. Why did you choose 3 and 4? Yeah, because 4 is the perfect square. Hey, Mr. Lippa. What's up? I'm recording for fifth hour, so don't say anything that you wouldn't want my fifth hour to hear. Yeah, I can. Is that right? Yeah, no problem. Thanks. That'd be good. Sick kid. Thank you. Thank you. Thank gotcha. You. Yeah, enjoy it. All right. <clears throat> Four is a perfect square. So the key was breaking up that square root, so it's a perfect square times something else. Since 4 is a perfect square, we're allowed to apply that square root. The square root of 4 is 2, so we take the 2 out of the square root. We have 2 root 3. I'll throw this on here as well. The idea of rationalizing the denominator. would be a good thing to be familiar with. And then the second big thing, I'm not going to list all the properties here. Uh, a lot of you probably have this on your notes, which I'll keep trying to pass back today from when we took this quiz and test. But there are five exponent rules, 
or properties. We don't like rules. We'll go with properties. Which remember, talked about if we are multiplying bases that are the same, what do we do with the exponents? If we are dividing bases that are the same, what do we do with the exponents? If we have a power raised to another power, what do we do? So those five rules or those five properties would be a good thing to be familiar with as well. Here's our last couple of things. I'm running out of colors. Oh, that's a new one. This is a big picture thing. Exponential functions. Which remember, all of them had this form. Y equals A times B raised to the X power. All of them had that form. Now we broke it down. I don't know why it's putting that there. There we go. Now we break that down and we have different versions of that that we use, but all of them have that form, a times b to the x. One version would be exponential growth, where y equals a, instead of b, we have 1 plus r to the x. Because remember, growth, it's got to be greater than 1. If we multiply by something smaller than 1, it's not going to work out. It's actually, if we multiply by something smaller than 1, it's going to be decay. Just to backtrack here, I'll mark this. Remember, A is our y-intercept. B is our common factor. Or we've called B our rate at times as well. If we ever see the word compound, in one of our equations that's dealing with exponential functions, something like uh, Brian had put $200 in the bank, the account earned 2.5% interest, compounded monthly. If we see the word compound, then we need to use our compound, whoops, interest. We need to use our compound interest formula, which was y equals the principal, which is kind of like our a value, or starting amount, times 1 plus the rate over n, n to the t. Remember, n just said if it was compounded monthly, n would be 12. Compounded quarterly, n would be 4. It's how many times a year that is compounded. And the last thing that we had was this, with this, was a geometric sequence, which was of the form a sub n equals a sub 1 times r to the n minus 1. Again, just like arithmetic, this would be considered our explicit equation or finding the nth term. I could tell you to find the 150th term. You could plug 150 in and tell me exactly what it is. An offshoot of that that's worth pointing out is the recursive. The recursive form, which we could have with arithmetic or geometric, which was a sub 1 when you give the first term. And then you say, okay, here's how I get from the first term to the next one. a sub 1 equals this. a sub n equals, you know, something times a sub n minus 1. Or a sub n minus 1 plus something. So we'll practice those on our exam. Whoa. Oh, that didn't do it up there. That's kind of weird. The words all are, like, glowing on my screen. It's really odd. But... The last thing that I will remind you of that you should be prepared for, and this will be on your review, is a piecewise function. 
In fifth hour, I got a little excited and told you to cross this off your exam review. Uh, you're gonna need to uncross that off. Remember, a piecewise could mean something like we have a line here, we have a line here, and we write an equation for each one of them. Let's say this, well, here I'll change color. Let's say that this one had an equation of 2x. Then we have to give a restriction. We only want this when x is greater than or equal to 1. We don't want the whole thing. We only want part of it. If we look at the yellow, let's say that equation is 2x plus 3. Well, we only want this one when x is less than 1. We only want it from 1 when the x's are less. That's the only time we want that equation. We don't want the whole thing. We only want part of it. So you'll review piecewise a little bit today, though.